Hello everyone. So this video sparks the or is the second video with respect to aggregate demand and aggregate supply, sessions 11 and 12. So you can think of this as session 12. And where we had finished off, maybe let's just go back to see what we had covered before. We were in the process of distinguishing between the Keynesian and the classical aggregate supply curves, which can be thought of as representing different time frames in an economy, with the Keynesian aggregate supply curve being representative of a situation where there's lots of unemployment, potentially a short-run situation, and the classical aggregate supply curve reflecting a situation where the economy is at its full employment level of output, and that would be a more long-run scenario. We also want to understand the price adjustment mechanism and how this relates to aggregate supply over different time frames. We were looking at deriving the aggregate demand curve and then looking at how aggregate demand and aggregate supply interact with different policy interventions. So it's really, to some extent, the last three of these bullet points that we have yet to deal with. So I'm going to scroll ahead. Um, what I suggest you do is obviously watch the first video with respect to session 11 and 12 before moving on to this one. What we are going to be looking at here is aggregate supply and the price adjustment mechanism. You need to recall what the difference is between the Keynesian and the classical long run and the short run aggregate supply curves because these are really extreme positions in terms of where the economy can be with respect to producing output. So the long run aggregate supply curve, which is the vertical aggregate supply curve, with the long run aggregate supply curve or the vertical aggregate supply curve, if the level of output exceeds potential output, this is going to result in an immediate increase in wages and increased prices, which will push the output level back to full employment. This is quite different to in the short run case where wages don't increase, so output will increase without prices rising. And in the medium run, what we're going to see is that there is both an adjustment in wages and prices, as well as in output. Now, these things by themselves don't seem to make much sense at all. So what I'm going to do is show you some diagrams to help explain this. And then also, we will go on to think about how the aggregate supply curve changes position over time. So what I'm going to do is switch to the document camera and... What I am doing here is drawing in three, or what will ultimately be three different sets of axes for the three different possibilities, short run, medium run, and long run. So over here, they're not all going to line up nicely because I haven't given myself enough space. Let's just move that up a bit. Okay. The first thing that we're going to think about is the short run case. So in the case of short run aggregate supply, also known as the Keynesian aggregate supply, where we're looking at the relationship between outputs, where this is real output, and on the vertical axis we're looking at the price level. And in the short run, what we can see is that when the level of aggregate demand is drawn in, we are able to identify what the equilibrium price level will be and what the equilibrium level of output will be. In the short run, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services and the aggregate demand curve shifts from AD to AD1, what we can then see is that the level of output will increase. Now, if we call this, just for the purposes of illustration, um, the full employment level of output, then in the short run, as we move from point A to point B, what we are suggesting is that when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services, then output will exceed the potential level of output. But in this case, there is no change in the wage and therefore no, whoopsie, no change in prices. 
And this is because in the short run, we are suggesting that there is a lot of unemployment and that firms would find it easy to increase the amount of output they produce without that affecting their marginal cost of production. In other words, wages won't rise, and if wages don't rise, then prices won't rise as well. If we think about the medium run, so medium run aggregate supply, which is kind of after the short run, you would get the long, the medium run. And here we've got real output. And here we once again have the price level. Then the medium run would be a positively sloped aggregate supply curve. Now, depending how close to the short run you are, this medium run aggregate supply curve could be quite flat or it could be quite steep. Okay. The intersection of the demand and the supply for goods and services will determine the equilibrium price level and the equilibrium level of output. And let's also call that point A. And here, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services from AD to AD1, output will rise and the price level will also rise. So in the medium run, there is some opportunity for the economy to be able to expand the level of output. So here, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services, and the level of output is greater than the potential level of output, there will be some increase in wages, and therefore some increase in prices, but it is not enough to return the economy to the full employment level of output. So what we see here is that there is also some increase in output in the medium run. And in fact, in fact output increases beyond the potential level of output. Let's just move this up so that everything's on the same page. If we now think about the long run, which is the third set of axes that we're putting in here, where we've got, once again, real output. And let me just move this away. And over here, the price level, P. Then in the long run, where we have uh, the long run aggregate supply curve, and we can draw in the level of aggregate demand, and this is the price level P, then in the long run, when the demand for goods and services increases from AD to AD1, here I'm going to show at the existing price level the fact that the demand for goods and services, represented by Y, is greater than the supply of goods and services, represented by Y star. But the economy won't be able to achieve that additional level of output in the long run if it's already using all of its factors of production to its full potential. So what we're suggesting as we move from the short run to the medium run to the long run is that in the short run we can increase outputs. In the medium run we can increase output but at a cost which is higher prices and in the long run it's very difficult to increase outputs because there we're definitely using all of the factors of production to their fullest potential. And so as we move from equilibrium at A to a situation of excess demand at point A prime, it's actually not possible for the economy to be able to meet that excess demand for goods and services and therefore in the long run, the only effect of the expansion in the demand for goods and services is that prices will rise. So here, in the long run, which is also known as the classical case, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services and output is greater than the potential level of output, here, wages adjust fully and prices also adjust fully. So here there is a complete adjustment in prices and no change in output. 
the economy moves back to the full employment level of output and production. Sometimes you'll also see this referred to, specifically the extreme cases. In the Keynesian case, we say that prices and wages are very, very slow to adjust to changes in aggregate demand to the extent that prices and wages do not adjust at all to changes in aggregate demand. In the long run case, we say that prices and wages are completely flexible and will adjust um, quickly or fully to changes in the aggregate demand for goods and services. In the medium run, prices and wages are somewhat sticky, so there will be some price and wage adjustments when the demand for goods and services changes, but because prices and wages do not adjust completely, it is possible for output to increase. Now to just think about how we move from the short run to the medium run to the long run, I'm going to flip the page over and draw in, I'm going to do this quite big, um, draw in a set of axes where once again we have real output, Y, and the price level, P. And what we are going to draw in is an aggregate demand curve. AD and a short run aggregate supply curve. Short run aggregate supply, and we're going to suggest that that is the full employment level of output and that the price level is P. Here, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services in the short run, we go from AD to AD1, and output can increase from Y star to Y1. In the medium run, however, if we just make that point A, and this is point A1. In the medium run, the aggregate supply curve will be positively sloped. So we draw in the positively sloped medium run aggregate supply curve. And then, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services starting at A, and the demand for goods and services increases from AD to AD1, we move from A to A2. And output will rise a little bit in the medium run, but not by as much as it would in the short run. So whereas in the short run, output can increase from Y star to Y1, in the medium run, it only increases from Y star to Y2. And then, let me just get another colour out. Um, what colour are we going to use? Let's try pink. If we were dealing with the long run, this was our long run aggregate supply curve. Oh, and what we haven't shown in here is the price level adjustment. So P to P2. Okay. All right, so maybe just to start the explanation again, starting from point A, in the short run, along the blue short run aggregate supply curve, when there is an increase in the demand for goods and services from AD to AD1, output can increase from Y star to Y1, and the equilibrium moves from A to A prime. This is because in the short run, a lot of unemployment means that firms can expand production without an additional um, change to their marginal costs of production, average costs of production don't change, and so prices do, are not affected. In the medium run, when the aggregate supply curve is positively sloped, when the demand for goods and services increases from A, the new equilibrium will change to be at A2. In this case, firms are able to start increasing their production, but not by as much as in the short run. So here, firms will begin to experience some increase in their marginal cost of production, and specifically wages start to rise, which is what places upward pressure on prices. Starting at A in the long run, if there is an increase in the demand for goods and services from, point, from AD to AD1, then in the long run, the economy will move from point A to point A3. And what we can then see is that in the long run, output will not change. Output will remain at Y star, but the price level will rise. What we can then in effect see is that over time, the aggregate supply curve can be thought of as rotating. Okay, I'm using the pen to illustrate this. 
It starts off from being a horizontal aggregate supply curve, representing an economy in the short run. And I haven't drawn all the possible medium run aggregate supply curves in here, but you can think of there as being many different options in terms of exactly where the economy is in the medium run. And that will allow us to have a positively sloped aggregate supply curve. And eventually in the long run, the aggregate supply curve and the sort of economy that is represented um, in the long run would have a vertical aggregate supply curve. What we can then show is over time, the aggregate supply curve pivots from being horizontal to positively sloped to vertical. What's happening over time in terms of prices, and this diagram you'll also see in the lecture slides, is that over time, in fact, I just need to double check what the slides are showing here, so I just get the axes right. Okay, it's prices and output over time. So over here, if we've got output and we've got the price level, and we're measuring prices at different points in time, this would be the one price level at time period one. Then we would have in time period two, prices would go up to P2, so that's time period 2, and in time period 3, prices would go up to P3, and so on. Okay, so what we see with respect to how the economy changes over time is that the ability of the economy to respond to changes in the demand for goods and services depends on the time frame. In the short run, the economy is very responsive to changes in aggregate demand to the extent that production can increase, but prices won't change. In the medium run, the economy is somewhat responsive to changes in aggregate demand. Output will rise, but there will be a price effect. Prices will rise too. And in the long run, the economy cannot respond to changes in aggregate demand in terms of increasing outputs. In the long run, the effect of an increase in the demand for goods and services on the economy is that output will remain fixed, but prices will rise. All right, let's go back formally to the slides here um, from current slide. This diagram, or these two diagrams, are basically representing what I have now shown you on the written version. What we can see is that as we move from the short run in terms of a horizontal aggregate supply curve to the medium run in terms of positively sloped um, aggregate supply curves, to the long run, in terms of a vertical aggregate supply curve, is that the aggregate supply curve is flatter, the smaller the impact of output and employment changes on current prices. So in the short run, the aggregate supply curve is flat, and when demand changes, there is no effect on current prices. In the long run, when the aggregate supply curve is vertical, output does not change, and the full effect of a change in aggregate demand is borne by prices. If prices respond little to changes in unemployment, then aggregate supply is flat. In the short run, when the demand for goods and services changes, prices will not change at all. In the medium run, prices will change a little, and so will output. In the long run, prices will change, but output will not change. We can define the aggregate supply curve equation as follows. Let me just get the pen out. When we're talking about the aggregate supply curve, we're thinking about how the aggregate supply curve is determining prices in the future. So prices in the future, PT plus 1 would refer to prices in the next period, are dependent on prices today as well as lambda, which is the speed of adjustment of prices, or how quickly the intermediate aggregate supply curve rotates. When we say intermediate, we're talking about how quickly that positively sloped aggregate supply curve moves from being quite flat to quite steep. And then here, what we've got is the difference between the actual level of output and the potential level of output. So the actual level of output and the potential level of output, the difference between them is known as the output gap. The price level in the next period 
is then critically dependent on how far the economy is away from its full employment level of production, how quickly prices are adjusting, as well as the price level today. And what we have done in the tutorials is we have given you some examples to think of about how prices will adjust in the future depending on the difference between actual outputs and potential outputs and depending on the price level. Okay. Alright, let's think about shifts in the aggregate demand curve. As we know, the aggregate demand curve represents combinations of the price level and outputs at which the goods and money markets are simultaneously in equilibrium. So what we do know is that the aggregate demand curve is representing combinations of prices and levels of outputs. What we may not have heard of before is this idea that the goods and the money markets need to be simultaneously in equilibrium. Now this part, the goods market and the money market descriptions, will be given in macro 2. So for now, just learn the definition of aggregate demand as it stands, but you will understand more about what the goods and money markets are representing in macro 2. When we think about the aggregate demand curve and its position, we have recognized that the aggregate demand curve can shift to the right or to the left due to policy changes such as expansionary or contractionary monetary or fiscal policies. And in addition, the aggregate demand curve can, position can change because of boosts to or um, decreases in consumer and investor confidence. So essentially, the aggregate demand curve can shift to the right or it can shift to the left, depending on the sorts of policy measures which take place. And as we move through the slides, we will go through this in a little bit more detail. We can also think about the relationship between output and prices in terms of movements along the aggregate demand curve. And to illustrate this, I want to use the document cam once again. So I'm going to switch to that in a second once I've got my paper ready. And let's just switch quickly to the document cam. Um, let's do that. All right. So what we are trying to explain here, and let me just put a heading on my page. This is Econ 201 Macro 1 ADAS, and this is a movement along the aggregate demand curve. Okay. There we go, that's clear. All right, so if we have, and I'm just going to draw in the aggregate demand curve. Aggregate demand curve, this remember is real output, or Y. This is the price level, P. And when we're thinking about a movement along, we are really thinking about moving from, say, point A, where prices are PA and output is YA, to a point such as B, where the price level is PB and the level of output is YB. So a movement along the aggregate demand curve could be up from say B to A, or it could be down from A to B. So let's think first of all about what could cause a movement up the aggregate demand curve. Okay, So from point B to point A. In terms of a movement up the aggregate demand curve, so from B to A, for example, as we move from B to A, we're thinking about prices rising. So that would be an increase in the price level from PB to PA. Okay? What we need to recognize is that when prices rise, such as from PB, to PA, that is going to decrease the real money supply. Now remember that the real money supply is given by definition as the value of nominal money stock over or adjusted for prices. If we assume that the nominal money stock remains constant and prices are rising, 
then overall the real money stock is falling. So when prices rise from PB to PA, for a given mon um, nominal money stock, for a given quantity or face value of money in circulation, as the purchasing power of that money decreases because prices have risen, that's referred to as a decrease in the real money supply. That decrease in the real money supply will increase interest rates, decrease investment expenditure, and lead to a decrease in the demand for goods and services and a decrease in output. So when prices rise from PB to PA, output falls from YB to YA. All right? Thinking of another or the other direction, if we go from A to B, here, as we go from A to B, prices would be decreasing. There would be a decrease in prices from PA to PB. When prices decrease, that would be an increase in the real money supply. And again, let's think about it. So if you have nominal money stock or nominal money supply divided by the price level, and if nominal money stock is constant, and the price level is falling, we're suggesting that with our face value of cash notes and coins in circulation, prices are dropping. So the purchasing power of our money when price levels are falling is increasing. We have a given amount of nominal money stock, goods and services are becoming cheaper. In real terms, we can purchase more. So the overall real money supply is increasing. As the real money supply increases, that would be associated with a decrease in interest rates, an increase in investments, an increase in the demand for goods and services, and an increase in the level of output. So, when prices fall from PA to PB, there is a movement down the aggregate demand curve from A to B, and output increases from YA to Y, B. Okay, so that's movements along the aggregate demand curve. The important thing to note is that movements along the aggregate demand curve are caused by changes in prices affecting the real money supply. Another way, though, to illustrate the change or the movement along the aggregate demand curve is in terms of the quantity theory of money. So I'm just going to do this on the same page, quantity theory of money. And the quantity theory of money, if you recall from last year, last year, suggests that the value of money stock, M, multiplied by the velocity of circulation, V, where V is representing how quickly nominal money stock changes hands, is equal to the price level multiplied by the amount of output being produced in the economy. So here, M is nominal money stock, or the face value of cash notes and coins in circulation. V is the velocity of circulation, or how quickly that money changes hands. P is the price level, and Y is real output. Okay? What the quantity theory of money allows us to show is that if we assume that in an economy the value of nominal money stock in circulation is constant, in other words the quantity of cash notes and coins in circulation is stable, if we also assume that the velocity of circulation in the economy is stable, in other words, the number of times on average that cash notes and coins change hands is constant, then if prices in the economy rise, output must fall. And that's exactly what we see as a movement along the aggregate demand curve. When prices in the economy go up, the quantity of goods and services demanded must fall. That has to be the case to maintain the identity. 
the value on the left hand side has, has to remain constant. So if part of what's determining those values are changing, they must be changing in opposite directions. If prices are rising, output is falling. Or alternatively, if prices are falling, output must be rising. Okay, so we can explain movements along the aggregate demand curve as being initiated primarily by price changes. Changes in prices, we can think about it in one way, as changes in prices affect the real money supply, which affects the aggregate demand and quantity of goods and services demanded. We can also think about it in terms of the quantity theory of money, because to keep the, or to maintain the identity MV equals PY, if we keep the nominal money stock constant and the velocity of circulation constant, in other words, the left-hand side of this equation is going to be a constant value, if prices rise, output must fall to maintain the identity, or alternatively, if prices fall, output must rise. Okay, where to from here? Let me just go back here um, from the current slide. All right. So we've explained the aggregate demand relationship in terms of output and prices, where we're specifically talking about movements along the aggregate demand curve. This slide also refers to movements along the aggregate demand curve. It's just using the quantity theory of money to provide the explanation. So that's like what we did on or using the document camera. This is a further explanation where what we are picking up is that inverse relationship between prices and the amount of output. So if you look here, what we had said is that if we assume that the velocity of circulation is constant, and if we assume that nominal money stock is constant, then when prices rise, output must fall. When prices fall, output must rise. So what we are suggesting here is, as we did on the document cam, if the money supply, the nominal money stock is unchanged and prices rise, this will decrease people's purchasing power and less or fewer goods and services will be demanded. This leads to a movement along an existing aggregate demand curve. Alternatively, if the nominal money stock is unchanged and prices fall, this will lead to an increase in purchasing power and more aggregate demand. And that will also be a movement along the existing aggregate demand curve. Okay, as I said earlier, we will talk about what causes shifts of the aggregate supply of the aggregate demand curve. And here it's important to note that shifts of the aggregate demand curve are caused when something changes except for prices. So you'll see that it is highlighted here in red that when aggregate demand changes due to a factor other than a changing price level, this will cause a shift of the aggregate demand curve either to the right or to the left. So I am once again just going to illustrate this using the document cam. So let's go back. I apologize for the switching about, but to some extent it does at least keep the videos a little bit more entertaining, I would suppose. Okay, so what we are doing here is we are thinking about aggregate demand I'm drawing in the aggregate demand curve. This is aggregate demand, AD. This is real output. This is the price level. And what I am showing you is what would cause at the existing price level. So here I'm drawing this and this is, is not an aggregate supply curve. I'm using this to show the existing price level. Okay. And what we want to know is what would cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right at the existing price level, or what would cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left at the existing price level. So if we start at A, what causes the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right, to 81? And what causes the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left, to 82? 
Note again that what I have drawn in here is not an aggregate supply curve. I have merely drawn a horizontal line in at the existing price level to demonstrate that the price level is being held constant. Okay, so let's think of the first thing, which is an increase in aggregate demand. An increase in aggregate demand would be caused by any expansionary policy. And expansionary policies can be twofold. They can arise from the government. Um, in South Africa, um, fiscal policies are implemented by the National Treasury and are specifically policies that are related or come, stem from the government. An expansionary policy could be an increase in government expenditure or a decrease in the tax rate. Note I've shown the tax rate as a lowercase t. The increase in government expenditure will get multiplied through the economy and cause an increase in the demand for goods and services at the existing price level. A decrease in taxation will increase people's disposable income, which will increase consumption expenditure, and that increase in consumption expenditure will get multiplied through the economy to cause an increase in the demand for goods and services. Note that if a tax rate cut also affected firms, if it meant that firms had to pay less of their profits to the government in the form of taxes, then firms might be encouraged to reinvest. And so a decrease in the tax rate could also increase investment expenditure, which would get multiplied through the economy and cause an increase in the aggregate demand for goods and services. That means that at the existing price level, the aggregate demand curve shifts to the right. So here, these expansionary policies, specifically expansionary fiscal policies implemented through the National Treasury, will increase the aggregate demand at existing price levels. We illustrate that as a rightward shift of the aggregate demand curve from AD to AD1. So this is AD to AD1. So that's an expansionary fiscal policy. In addition, there could be expansionary monetary policies. So expansionary monetary policy. And an expansionary monetary policy would be anything which increases nominal money stock. So here, an increase in nominal money stock which could be brought about by a decrease in interest rates or increase investment expenditure and that will get multiplied through the economy and cause an increase in the demand for goods and services. This mechanism which takes place in the money market, the change in the nominal money stock and the interest rate, you will cover in much more detail in the Macro 2 part of the course. For now though, an expansionary monetary policy, which is implemented via the South African Reserve Bank in South Africa, would involve making um, money cheaper, lowering interest rates, which lowers the cost of borrowing, and this could increase firms' investments. Note that it could also increase consumption expenditure, and that would also increase the demand for goods and services. Again, this increase in aggregate demand that takes place is at existing price levels. And so that means that the aggregate demand curve is moving from AD to AD1, but at the price of P. In terms of contractionary policies, a contractionary policy simply works in the opposite direction to the expansionary policies. So a contractionary policy, such as a move from AD to AD2, would be a decrease in aggregate demand. To show the contractionary policies, I'm going to be using the green pen. And here, we could have an expansionary policy or a contractionary policy. And that contractionary policy could be fiscal. Okay. And note that all I have to do here is change the direction of arrows. 
A decrease in government's expenditure would get multiplied through the economy and cause a decrease in the demand for goods and services. An increase in taxation would decrease disposable income, which would decrease consumption expenditure and decrease the demand for goods and services. In addition, an increase in taxation could lower investment expenditure, which would get multiplied through the economy and cause a decrease in the demand for goods and services. So overall, the contractionary policy, which will shift the aggregate demand curve to the left at the existing price level, will overall decrease the demand for goods and services. And here we're thinking about aggregate demand going from AD to AD2. With a contractionary monetary policy, so here, contractionary monetary policy, again, we can just change the direction of the arrows. Lowering money stock increases interest rates, decreases investment expenditure, that gets multiplied through the economy to decrease the demand for goods and services. Lower, raising interest rates sorry, will also lower consumption expenditure because when interest rates go up it becomes more expensive to borrow money. Consumption expenditure that depends on interest rates will fall, that gets multiplied through the economy causing a decrease in the demand for goods and services. Overall, the demand for goods and services is lower at existing price levels. And so here we're thinking about the aggregate demand curve moving from AD to AD2. So note what the big difference is. A movement along the aggregate demand curve is when along a given aggregate demand curve, we're thinking about prices and output changing. When we talk about shifts of the aggregate demand curve, we're talking about output changing at the existing price level. We're talking about an expansionary monetary or fiscal policy increasing the demand for goods and services, or a contractionary monetary or fiscal policy lowering the demand for goods and services. The other thing that could cause an expansion in aggregate demand would be boosts in investor or consumer confidence, so if both consumers and investors are very confident in an economy, this will raise the demand for goods and services and the aggregate demand curve will shift to the right at existing price levels. Alternatively, in terms of contractionary um, effects on the demand for goods and services, anything which decreases investor or consumer confidence will ultimately decrease the demand for goods and services at the existing price level. All right, let's see what else we have to talk about here. Um, uh, slide show from current slide. Okay, so what I have done on the document projector is to provide some context for this slide. I have shown you the diagram which illustrates how the demand for goods and services can increase or decrease at the existing price level. Expansionary policies, monetary or fiscal, will shift aggregate demand to the right at the existing price level, and boosts in consumer and investor confidence will also increase the demand for goods and services at the existing price level. Contractionary monetary or fiscal policies will decrease the demand for goods and services at the existing price level, and the aggregate demand curve will shift to the left. In addition, declines in consumer and investor confidence will also decrease the demand for goods and services. Okay, I think that's that for this video, and hopefully I will be back with some more on aggregate demand and aggregate supply.